Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Would you stand with us? It's good to see you all. Welcome. Visitors, we're glad you're with us to worship with us. Let's uh, pray together and we will sing and praise our Lord. Amen. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your wonderful mercy and your wonderful love for us. We pray that you will be glorified in our time together as we sing praise to you, as we fellowship with one another, and as we study your word today. Pray that people will come to know you as Savior in this time together. If there's anyone here that does not know you, and I pray that you will just work in their hearts, and that you will teach us how to be more like you today. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's sing this together. Reaching out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us a greater glimpse of an ever-changing God. I will worship. 
worship with all of my heart and I will praise you with all of my strength and I will seek you all of my days and I will follow worthy of our praise. Amen. And he's enough. Amen. More than anything, he is enough for all of us and all of our struggles and our trials and our sin and, and our victories and our joys and everything in between. Christ is enough. Amen. Let's sing this together. Christ is my reward. Christ is my reward in all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Yeah. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before. decided decided we're going to follow you. We've given our lives to you. You have redeemed us and saved us out of our sin. And we are so grateful and pray that you will help us to serve you and live our lives in a way that reflects that, that we truly believe that. We don't just sing it because it's words on a screen um, or some neat saying, but that we truly believe it and put it into practice into our lives. Pray that, pray that for us today. Thank you for Pastor Jason. And pray that you will speak through him as he comes to share your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, well good morning. And I know it's a 4th of July weekend, so I wore the most patriotic shirt I had. And I know some of you were like, wait, what? Well, Tennessee is America's team. And... Um, it is, I know you're thinking like, well, that's, I thought that was Dallas. Well, that's because you haven't read well. And if you're more well-read and you read the UT alumni Facebook page, Tennessee is the greatest team of all time. And if you truly want to be patriotic, you would support America's team, which is Tennessee. So if you are not, then I guess you're just not American enough. But no, this is the time of year where things are... Fun and things are hot. People are swimming. People are having fun. People are doing a lot of things. There's a lot of times in summer. There's there's hopes. There's dreams. School kids are out of school. They're loving it. They're not wanting to go back. You know, Tennessee fans are like, this is our year. And then August hits, and we're like, it's not our year again. But sometimes there's you know, summer can be a very odd time. It can be a weird time, you know, parents trying to figure out what to do with their kids, their kids are doing this and that, people are traveling, coming and going, we have like a 4th of July weekend that we're supposed to celebrate, and we celebrate by blowing things up, and I don't know why, but we do, and usually some, you hear on the news, you hear people of losing fingers and eyes and all these crazy things, you think about what you did as a teenager, and you're like, wow, how am I still here, you know, and all those type of things, and summer can be a very just, I don't know, different time. And as we're going through, we're seeing that the world quickly changes. No matter what's going on in life, or no, what matter, no matter what's happening, or what time of year, whether it's the holiday season, or whether it's the summer, and kids are out of school, there's a constant that's happening in our culture in the background. It is constantly changing. There is a constant battle for your soul. See, we're in a spiritual battle. No matter what time of year it is, no matter what's going on, the enemy never takes a holiday. The enemy never takes time to slumber. And yet there are so many times as believers that we take breaks or we back off or we slow down in our prayer, in our Bible study, in our witnessing. You know, vacation is a wonderful time to be able to share the gospel with people that you've not, got, you've not met before. But oftentimes we don't, 
We don't approach vacation in that way. We tend to vacation from God and from church, from those type of things. And so we've got to be mindful that there is a battle. And it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against spirits. The enemy is attacking. And that's why we've been going through the summer a biblical worldview on gender and then singleness, marriage, and family. So we've spent the last three weeks talking about God created a male and female. He gave specific designs and duties of males and females within the life of the church. And all those type things. And now we're transitioning where we're going to begin talking about relationships with one another. How those males and females are to interact with one another. But as we transition into talking about different types of relationships, we got to keep in mind that our primary relationship or the relationship of greatest value is our relationship with Christ. Not our relationship with one another, not a relationship with the world, not a relationship with our stuff or the, our goals, our hopes and our dreams. The most valued relationship we have is that of Christ. And if you miss that relationship, you will miss all the others. I mean, I'm sure you all have heard it said, the analogy before, like if you're off one degree here, later down the road you're going to be a thousand degrees off. And you remember that in math, or maybe some of you tried to block math out of your memory, but you would look at those angles, right? And it start off really tiny, and that gap just grows and grows and grows. And that's what can happen to us if we're not careful. When we allow things to become more important or more valued than our relationship with God, what happens is, is there begins to be this separation. And before we know it, there's this massive separation that we never imagined possible between us and God. So that's why we need to keep in mind that our greatest relationship, our most valued relationship is that with God himself. So whether you're single, whether you're married, again, your number one relationship is with your Heavenly Father. Everything we do should be with this in mind. So this week in particular, we're going to be talking about singleness. And how we should view singleness according to scripture. But again, in order to have the biblical worldview when it comes to singleness, you, also, you have to start with your personal relationship with your Heavenly Father. Because again, the enemy will be tempting you. To look at whatever your relationship status is or whatever you're at in life, it will be, you will be tempted to look at it and be disappointed in it or to find fault or to find problems. That includes singleness and marriage alike and all that's in between. So something to keep in mind, which I've read this verse kind of each time we've talked about male or female, we're going to... We're going to share that verse again, Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16. For you formed me, my inward parts, you, moved, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book... Were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So again, what's important is we start with this in mind. that Our most valued relationship is with our Heavenly Father. And when that's your most valued relationship, you begin to understand that you are wonderfully, fearfully made. That God wove you together in your mother's womb. He knit you together uniquely, specifically, and he has designed you ultimately for his, to experience his glory, to worship him, to enjoy him, and to experience his love and his peace and his joy and all those things. And now he's got, and then when you, you, you come into this world and you begin to grow and you begin to mature and, and physically and mentally and spiritually, God had, you begin to learn that God has a very specific plan for your life that is unique there's a reason that you were born in the day you were born in. There's a reason that none of us were born in 1705 or 
you know, 3000 BC. There's a reason that we were born this day because in this moment, in this time, God has chosen to use you for his glory in this culture. It's not by accident that you're in Winchester, Tennessee this morning. It's not by accident that you were born when you were born or born into the family you were born into. God has a very specific plan for your life. And that's why you have to have that relationship with your Heavenly Father as your most valued relationship. Because you are made for His glory. So with that in mind as the background, you can turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we'll begin in verse 7 through 9. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7 through 9, it says, Yeah, I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Oftentimes, I don't believe we emphasize the fact that singleness is actually a gift from God. Singleness is not a plague. It's not something that we should avoid at all cost. Singleness, like marriage, are both gifts. They're different types of gifts, but they're gifts nonetheless. So how is singleness actually a gift? Paul calls it here as each man has his own gift in this manner. So he's speaking of singleness being a gift. Well, that gift allows you freedom to serve Christ in any moment, in any place. Generally speaking, singles have more mobility. They can move in a, in a moment. They can you know, study Scripture more consistently. They, don't have, they have more time to dedicate to reading the Bible. Singles can serve more in the church because they have more time available. But see, most importantly, what makes singleness a gift is because God's word has said it is a gift. But what we see in our culture is we're seeing this idea that maybe singleness is kind of a, a plague. That you should avoid it at all costs. You see people jumping from relationship to relationship to relationship. And they, don't even can, they can't even go a day or two days or a week without being in a relationship. We see this in the teenage culture. Right? And in, in the early 20 culture, this idea of like they're constantly, it's like you see these girls go from boyfriend to boyfriend to boyfriend to boyfriend to boyfriend, or these boys going from girlfriend, 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 girlfriend. It's, it's a nonstop revolving door where it's just always, they always have to have somebody. Why is that? See, if you're unable to be single even for a moment, what that reveals is a lack of a healthy relationship with your Heavenly Father. Because in your mind, you're looking for validation in someone else other than Christ Himself. Ultimately, if you're seeking satisfaction through someone else, through a partner, you will be sorely disappointed. Because everyone will let you down at some point. It doesn't matter how amazing I think Cammie is. I think she's absolutely amazing. But if I put all of my hope and all of my desire into her, if I say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow her alone to, to fulfill me in life, that is a task that she cannot handle. If you're looking for fulfillment in an individual, a created being, or an object, or prestige, power, whatever it may be, you will always be left wanting. Ultimately, where we first find satisfaction is in Christ, in Him alone. That doesn't just go for singles, that goes for married couples as well. When you get married, again, you should be seeking all of your satisfaction, all your fulfillment in life in Christ, not in a spouse. Paul continues later down in chapter 7 explaining this idea of that singleness is a gift. It's a blessing from the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 7, picking up in verses 32 through 35. When he says, But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 
But the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world and how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. See, the singleness is an opportunity to be wholly, wholeheartedly dedicated to Christ and the church. This is why Paul describes it as free from concern or secure, you're able to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. See, the International Mission Board understands the gift of holiness, the gift of singleness, I mean. So what they do is they set up this program. If you're single and you're a college student that just graduated college or finishing up college or you're around about that age of, of early 20s, they will send you as a journeyman. And it's a two-year mission. You'll be sent and pair up with these missionary teams all around the world for two years. And you're able to serve because singles are able to accomplish some things that married people can't accomplish when it comes to serving the Lord. And it got me thinking, why is there so little talk within the church about singles having undistracted devotion to the Lord? While at the same time, which some of our recent high school graduates and those in college or just finishing college, they, they, can, they can tell you this. And you probably remember back in the, the olden days, back in the 1900s when all of us were graduating high school and all that good stuff. It's weird to think about, isn't it? It was in the 1900s. I heard somebody mention that one time. Oh, in the 1900s. They're like, no, 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 no. You can't say it like that. It was the 1990s, okay? It wasn't the 1900s. Anyway... Beside that, what we see is we don't see them asking. We don't, we, you don't get a lot of questions or inquiries from, about, from high, when directed towards high school or graduates and things like that. Like, oh, how do you plan on to be, being dedicated and devoted to the Lord in the years to come? What you hear and what you see in the Christian cultures, we're asking, where are you going to college? Are you, are you dating anyone? Are you going to get married? What's your career? Where are you going to live? How are you going to establish? We have all these questions about life on earth and hardly nothing when it comes to devotion to the Lord. And because we've done that as a church, we put such a priority on the things of the world that we've robbed these young people of the gift of singleness that God has given them. And there's this constant pressure as if marriage is the end-all, be-all of all things. That that is the most glorious relationship one can have. When really the most glorious relationship one can have is with Christ. That is the relationship that we should be pushing within the church. That's the relationship we should be lifting up. That's where we should be directing, hey, you just graduated high school? Awesome. How do you plan on being dedicated to the church and to the cause of Christ and getting the gospel to the world? But we don't ask that. We ask, where are you going? Where are you living? What are you doing? You getting married yet? Jesus speaking in John 14, 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He doesn't say, If you love me, you'll, hey, you'll go get married. Hey, if you love me, you'll go start a career. If you love me, you'll go get a house. You'll do all these things. And he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's speaking of the word of God. If you love me, you will keep the words that I have given you. So that is what we need to be pushing. And if you're keeping the word of God, see, as a single, part of loving God is keeping his word. Loving God and keeping his word means undistracted devotion to the Lord. Serving the Lord through the local church. That is not a suggestion. That's not something if you work around. That is what is required of you that are single. Just like we will speak later of, the, later of those who are married, you are required to love your spouse, to provide for your spouse, to, to serve them, and all that you're, that's required by Scripture. It's not a suggestion, it's required. Well, for singles, what is required is devotion to the church and the cause of Christ. So serving the local church is necessary, not a suggestion. So, singles... 
If you want to be living according to the Word of God, if you want to have a biblical worldview of where you're at as a single person, then you would be serving the church. You would be the ones that volunteer the most. Because you're able to have that time, the uninterrupted, the undistracted time that so many don't. Singleness is a blessing because you get to serve the Lord more so in His church. So we looked at how singleness is a gift. We look at how that gift is actually played out practically. It's played out by dedicating yourself to the Lord and learning the Word and and living it out and serving in the church and sharing the gospel. So next part we're going to look at, we're going to flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 18 through 20. We're going to look at also singleness is a commitment to purity. So 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 through 20, it says, Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. See, our physical body should be protected from sexual immorality. Why? He explains here. Because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Once you become a believer, what happens is you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And every believer receives the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. And you are sealed. And the Holy Spirit indwells you completely and fully. When was the last time that you really considered the fact that your physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So we learn from this particular passage that being the temple of the Holy Spirit brings certain implications. One, it implies that your body is designed for worship. It also implies that our bodies belong to God. And it also implies that sexual sin directly impacts our ability to glorify God. So first, your body is designed for worship. God created us male and female. We go back to Genesis. We find that. He created the male and female. He placed them in the garden. And he put everything under their dominion. He's like, care for the garden. Rule over the fish, the seas, and the birds, and the, and the beasts of the ground. You're to rule over those. You're to care for those. What God was doing is he's created the entire universe, all that you see, all that we experience, he created it all as a stage, kind of like a a platform in which we glorify God from. So you think about wires or trees and mountains and sky. This was given to us so that we may worship the Lord. But what we've done is we've taken the created world and the universe and we've tried to exploit it for our personal benefit. When in reality, this world was created as, an, as a way, as a kind of a, a useful tool and for us to glorify and worship the Lord and to know Him. See, Adam and Eve were given very specific body types to reflect the image of God, to work on the earth, to glorify God. Humans are literally designed to glorify God and enjoy God. Why? You look at our hands and our feet, our eyes, tongue, skin, and so forth. Everything you've been given was designed specifically for you to be able to glorify God, to know Him, to fellowship with Him, to interact with Him. That's why we are so different than all the other created beings. All the other created beings weren't designed to have a personal relationship with God, but we were from the very beginning. We were unique. We were set aside from all the other creation. We were to have dominion over it. Why? Because God specifically designed us to be in relationship with Him. So your body is designed for worship. Secondly, we see here that your body belongs to God. When He said, you are not your own. There at the end of verse 19. Often we hear phrases out in the world like, hey, just do it, have it your way, seek your own happiness, you do you. And we hear all these types of marketing slogans and all these things that are infiltrating our society. But ultimately those are things that are contrary to the word of God, which helps us understand that these are all ploys of the enemy. 
to pull us away from God. See, our bodies are not our own. We don't determine things. We're not the captains of our own ships. We are not the ones that decide how we're going to live, where we're going to live, and what we're going to do. We submit ourselves to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Our body is not our own. Your body belongs to the Lord. Therefore, everything you do and how you do it, you do that with the back of your mind. Hey, I'm not in charge of this. God is. And it's, a, it's an odd thing that Cami and I have talked about quite often throughout ministry. Is like you, you always hear of, of pastors or ministers or missionaries, things like that, praying about, okay, I'm, I'm praying about where God wants me to be, where he wants me to live, where he wants me to serve, and all this kind of stuff. But you rarely ever hear that from people outside of ministry. And it's like, well, I grew up here. I got a job here. This is where I live. Well, is, did you pray about where God wanted you to be? When was the last time that you just really sat back and be like, okay, God, you own all of this. this. I'm not my own. I belong to you. Where do you want me? Send me where you would send me. But what we do is we tend to make, we live our life kind of in the back of our mind saying like, well, what do I want? How do I want it? Where do I want it? But we are not our own. And thirdly, we see here that, your, your, that sexual sin directly impacts your ability to glorify God. We live in a culture where physical intimacy is no longer taboo. It is not only expected, but it is highly celebrated. See, God has a very high standard for our sexuality because he highly values our sexuality. The culture, on the other hand, has a very low view of sexuality. They have a very low value for your sexuality. The world doesn't care. Culture doesn't care. Why? Because the enemy understands that this area puts, it puts a problem, puts a barrier between you and God. And so we see in our culture that that's where the attack is mostly coming from. Look at the TV shows that people are consuming. Look at the entertainment that people consume. Just Not even just the world. Look at those that are in the church. Look at Christians. And it's like I can go. Th- I mean, I don't, I don't know if you realize, but pastors can see Facebook posts as well. You know, we can see those things. We're not oblivious to what's happening, what people are talking about. We see all this stuff. And it, it's just the number of believers that claim to be Christ followers. Oh, I love God. They put Bible verses up. And at the same time, they throw up these, oh, I love this TV show. And you're like... One of these is not like the other. And it is shameful that that's what's being pushed by Christians. Those that are claiming Christ, you have these pagan, awful, terrible shows where sexual immorality is praised and glorified and you, you, you see nudity everywhere and people are like, oh, it's just part of the show, it's art. No, it is an attack from the enemy, it is satanic. It's satanic, but we don't think of it in that regard. We've been desensitized or whatever we want to call it, but the reality of it is, is it is demonic. Any type of sexuality that is not according to Scripture is demonic. It's sinful. It's evil. we got to remember our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and spirits. There is a war going on. And right now for our singles, there is a war. There is a battle for your sexuality. There just is. The world is coming after it hard to the point where it's one of those things that it's commonplace in Christian culture. Even when I was in college, a lot of the people in our college ministry, a lot of those fellow college students, you begin finding out what they're doing with their boyfriends and girlfriends, and I'm like... How? What, well, that's just what people do. I'm like, no, that's what pagans do. But we were called out of this world to live a different type of life. 
See, for singles, there is a commitment to purity that must be a part of your life. But it's like we've thrown that commitment out the window. And I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier, because as a Christian culture as a whole, what we've done is we've so emphasized career. Where are you living? Where are you moving? Where are you going to college? What's your major? Oh, that major's not going to make any money. You should be this. You should be that. Oh, this, that, and the other. And we're like, oh, when are you getting married? When are you getting married? When are you having kids? We put all this emphasis on the things of this world, and we forget that the most valued relationship one can have is Christ. And we're not asking the questions, how are you dedicating your life to the Lord in this next season of life? When was the last time you asked a college graduate, hey, you're moving off to college? Great, have you found a church yet? What church are you going to be attending? And that's like, hey, what fraternity are you joining? I was a part of this one. Oh, what sorority? This was my sorority. Hey, what are you doing? We have all these worldly things that we keep pushing within the church, and then we wonder why 80% of the young people are walking away from the church. It's because we've taken God's word and we've ignored it. Singleness is a gift. It's a gift with responsibilities to be dedicated to the church. Singleness is a commitment to purity. But it's like we've forgotten to teach these things to our children, to the next generation. Lastly, as we talk about singleness, we do have to mention that while it is a gift and you're able to be devoted and there's a commitment to purity that follows along with that, there is also, singleness can also be hard and difficult. Just like marriage can be hard and difficult. Any type of relationship can be hard and difficult. You all have that coworker. I've got that coworker. Oh, wait, I only got one coworker. Wait, never mind. I'll take that back. <laughs> Deb's looking at me like he said what (laughs) but you've had that you've had the experience relationships can be difficult and singleness can be hard as well if you remember back in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 it says then the Lord God said it's not good for man to be alone I will make him a helper suitable for him see God designed us to desire relationships now the first relationship he has created us to desire again is our relationship with him and secondly our relationship with others that's why you see Jesus summing up all the commands when they ask him hey what's the greatest command he said well the greatest command is love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and strength love God first that is the great command the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself this idea that we are designed for relationships all of God's word is pointing us to the fact that we need to have healthy vibrant relationships with God and one another so we're designed for relationships not only do we desire should desire a relationship with God but we should desire a relationship with one another fellow believers And that's where singleness can sometimes be difficult. You might feel this pressure to hurry up and get married. You see this all across the landscape. You see people rushing into marriages because they just want to be married. Ignoring all the red flags, ignoring the signs and the advice of others. That's why we've got to make sure the number one relationship we're desiring above all is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Within the church, there's a variety of relationships that we should desire. Mentorships, friendships, family. I mean, we are a family. You should desire relationships within the church. But like we talked about earlier, sometimes being labeled single in a culture that is constantly and consistently pushing marriage, it can become lonely. It can become difficult, it can become hard, the pressure can be overwhelming and to the point where all of a sudden you now are think the only way you can be satisfied in life is if you're married. Again, like I mentioned earlier, our question to young people should be centered around their relationship with Christ. So as a church, we must do a better job of celebrating singleness and its opportunities. We should be remembering that and teaching that singleness is a gift from God that allows you to be dedicated to something greater than yourself. It allows you to be dedicated 
for the very purpose in which you've been created. And we know, reading through Scripture, guess what? One day, we, for all eternity, what are you going to be? You are going to be single, completely devoted to the Lord. Why not get started now? Why wait? Begin living for the Lord now. Learn to be satisfied in Christ first. And that goes for everyone. Not just singles, but married and everybody. Learn to be satisfied in your relationship with Christ first and foremost. Singleness is a gift. It is not a plague. It's not a problem. It's not something you avoid at all costs. It is a gift that you use from the Lord to be dedicated to the church. And in your dedication to church, you pursue purity because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not your own. It belongs to the Lord. And yes, there may be moments that your singleness is difficult and hard. Ask any married couple. That doesn't change when you get married. Sometimes being married can be difficult and can be hard. Life is difficult and hard because we live in a sinful, broken world. That's why we turn to Scripture. That's why we turn to God and make Him our most valued relationship. How do we make Christ our most valued relationship? First, it begins with salvation. Today, we're going to, it's the first Sunday of the month, and one of the traditions that we have started here is on the first Sunday of the month, we partake of the Lord's Supper. And the reason that we partake of the Lord's Supper, as it defines in Scripture, is to remember the, the gospel and the, the price that Christ paid that we may be forgiven, that we may be restored, may we have that right relationship with our Heavenly Father. So the only way that you can have the valued relationship with God is through Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. God has laid out the path. And it is narrow. And yes, the world will call this closed-minded. It will call it a lot of different things, but the reality of it is it doesn't change the fact that you have to come to Christ. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We are saying a little bit earlier, Christ is enough. I have decided to follow Jesus. Joshua laid it out for the people in the Old Testament. Choose this day whom you will serve. You have a choice. Singles, you have a choice. Who are you going to serve today? The world and yourself? Or Christ? Those of us who are married, it's the same question. Who are you going to serve? Praying that our answer be Christ and His church. But you can only do that if you have surrendered your life to Christ. So if you've never cried out to the Lord in salvation, you can do that today. I'd be happy to talk with you. Find someone around you before you leave today. We'd be more than happy to talk with you about that further. And this time we're going to stand and sing and continue to worship the Lord through song. I encourage you don't leave until you've dedicated all of yourself to Jesus.
down. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet. 